welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. On this program, we never shy away from controversial topics, and today is no exception. My guest, Jenny Sansusi, and I will be discussing the healing properties of cannabis, CBD, and medicinal mushrooms. Jenny is a health coach, wellness blogger, and the author of the new book, The Rebel's Apothecary, a practical guide to the healing magic of cannabis, CBD, and mushrooms. Now, she became an expert on these ancient rem remedies after her father was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. As it turns out, something that was once considered taboo was key in helping her dad. So she's here today to tell you how you can use these plants and fungi safely. Jenny, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Well, this is going to be fun. So can you start by telling our listeners about why and how you got interested in mushrooms and cannabis? Sure, yeah. Um, well, in 2017, Thanksgiving 2017, my dad was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, as you said. And that moment was a real before and after moment in my life. Um, if anyone you know, has been diagnosed with cancer and knows someone diagnosed with cancer, you know that hearing that information just completely changes your life in one instant. So as soon as he got diagnosed, I knew that I wanted to help in whatever way I could, whether that was with nutrition or supplements or you know, cooking for him or finding remedies that could work for him, plant-based remedies, anything that I could you know, could get my hands on, I wanted to, I wanted to try to find for him. And I had been working in the wellness world for many years. And I had some connections with functional medicine doctors and people in the wellness arena. And so I had this arsenal of people to reach out to and ask, you know, what are the things that I should look into when it comes to helping someone with not only treating the cancer, but really helping with the chemotherapy side effects in the immune system. Because I knew that I didn't know much about chemo or cancer at the time, but I did know that it, that chemo can really affect the immune system and people can not tolerate it sometimes because their immune system is so weakened. So I just thought, you know, what can I do to help my dad? And I just went full force into the research and cannabis and medicinal mushrooms were the two things I kept hearing about over and over again. And once I started to dive into the research there, it was really, really promising. So that's that's the route we decided to go on. So just so that everybody understands, your dad uh, was getting chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so um, you're not going to come on and say, you, my dad never got chemotherapy. All he did was uh, ha have a joint and chew on a mushroom and he's cured. <laughs> no, in fact, in fact, my dad was definitely sure that he wanted to go the traditional chemotherapy route for treating his cancer. And I was not about to try to, you know, get him to do otherwise. I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I was not going to, I wasn't going to go there, but I knew that I could support him with some home remedies. And we, you know, we talked to his oncologist and we got his oncologist on board with all the different things we were trying. And he said, you know, I don't know if this is going to help, but it probably won't hurt. So go ahead and we'll just keep monitoring his progress. So he has the, you know, the chemotherapy regimen at the hospital. And then we've had our our home regimen that we've been doing on the side. You know, that's actually great to hear because um, I work with a lot of cancer patients as well. And so many of their, their oncologists tell them, no, you know, you may not do alternative therapies during right. this chemotherapy. You know, how dare you? Don't even come near this stuff. It will hurt your chances. So tell me, actually, tell us about that process. How'd you, uh, how'd you find an oncologist that lets you do this, number one? Yeah, that's a really good point because I hear that from so many people that their oncologist said, no, absolutely not. Don't try cannabis, you know, medicinal marijuana, CBD, mushrooms. It, they say maybe it will hurt or they just don't have enough information about it to be able to say it's okay. And luckily for us, uh, we, we were paired with an oncologist who was open-minded to it. He definitely did not recommend that we do it. And he said, you know, this may not do anything, but I'm not going to tell you no. So he didn't, we were really lucky in that sense because a lot of oncologists don't do that. So what I always tell people to do is when they speak to their oncologist about potentially using home remedies and their oncologist says, no, maybe you'll agree with this. I always say, 
what's the exact reason why they're saying no? Is there something specific to your condition? Maybe there is. Maybe there is a drug interaction. Maybe there is something very specific to you and you shouldn't use these home remedies. Or, you know, if not, like maybe ask the oncologist if you oncologist if you could try it for one cycle, you know, until your next scan and see if everything is still okay. You know, if there's not a specific reason to you, maybe maybe they'd be willing to just let you see how it goes for one cycle. So what made you tell us about the your research that said, you know, we need to look into cannabis and CBD and medicinal mushrooms. What brought that to the forefront? Well, one of the things that happened really early on when my dad first got diagnosed is he watched a documentary about medical marijuana and it was and he had just recorded it because he thought it looked interesting. He wasn't even interested in it for himself. He just wanted to watch it. And it was all about cancer patients that were using medical cannabis and having really good results, you know, not only with their cancer, but with their with their side effects of their chemo. And so he his ears perked up at that immediately. And at the same time, CBD was just starting to emerge. And one of my friends said, hey, just look into CBD and cancer and see what you find. And I started researching that and I found so many stories of people who were using medical cannabis and CBD who have cancer and were experiencing relief. And then I started to look into studies. I went to a medical cannabis conference. I started to get in touch with medical cannabis doctors and asked them what their experience had been. And I just went straight down the rabbit hole. And I, I was, you know, I, I was really impressed by what I found in, in medical cannabis. And then with the mushrooms, um, I had already known that medicinal mushrooms could be helpful for the immune system. That was something that was already in my consciousness, but I didn't know a lot about them. And when I started to go down the route, the route of researching mushrooms, I found so much information there is about medicinal mushrooms being used in cancer hospitals and other parts of the world and people using it to help their immune systems. And it was really, really interesting. Okay, so explain to people as, as if they don't know the difference, may, hopefully most people know. So what's the difference between cannabis, CBD, and medicinal mushrooms? And are medicinal mushrooms different than magic mushrooms? Yeah, so cannabis, CBD is part of the cannabis plant it's a compound within the cannabis plant. And it's a compound that doesn't get you high. So THC is the compound that most people are familiar with inside the cannabis plant that does get you high. So they're two different molecules that are both within the same plant. The mushrooms, the medicinal mushrooms, all of the ones that my dad is taking and most of the ones that I write about in the book are completely non-psychedelic. So there's, you know, when people think about mushrooms, they usually think of grocery store mushrooms, like button mushrooms, portobellos, cremini's, or magic mushrooms that are going to take you on a, on a trip. There's another class of mushrooms that's considered medicinal mushrooms, which is they're edible and you know, you can consume them and they have medicinal properties, but they're not psychedelic. Gotcha. And, uh, you want, for the listeners, you want to name some of those medicinal mushrooms sure. for us. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the, the ones that, that I cover in the book and that my dad has been taking every day, chaga mushroom, reishi, Turkey tail is a big one. That's one of the first ones that we got him started on. Um, shiitake is a wonderful, actually a really great one for right now too, because it, shiitake has been shown to be antiviral. So that's a really interesting one to look at. Um, lion's mane and cordyceps and maitake. I believe those are those are all the all the ones. And then I do I do cover magic mushrooms a little bit in the book too, because there's some really interesting things going on in the research with, with psilocybin, which is a compound inside magic mushrooms. But that, that's not the main thing that, um, that we've been focusing on, but it's definitely an interesting one to pay attention to. All right, so you keep bringing up the immune system with mushrooms. In terms of uh, medical marijuana and CBD, where is the benefit that, with this in, in cancer patients? Sure. Uh, well, yeah, with the immune system, with the with the cannabis, what we had found with our research into cannabis is that THC and CBD both have properties that have been shown to kill tumors and and slow tumor growth, and they can help with the immune system. There's not enough research there yet because they can't do clinical trials on cannabis because of the legality. So this is a lot of preliminary research and anecdotal stories. So. That's with cannabis. With the mushrooms, 
all of the mushrooms that I just mentioned, aside from magic mushrooms, but all of the medicinal mushrooms that I mentioned have been shown to have immune system modulating properties. So they don't necessarily stimulate the immune system or, you know, dampen the immune system. They balance the immune system. So they're, they're considered adaptogens. So they can just help keep your immune system in balance. And all of them are, are really powerful for, you know, keeping that immune system strong. Yeah, we, uh, I have a, a patient who, oh, I think he's now 10 years out from uh, stage four pancreatic cancer. And uh, he, we treated him basically with a raw food diet and a lot of mushroom uh, extracts, particularly coleus, um, turkey tail. And right. uh, he's, uh, like I say, knock on wood, he's cancer free now for 10 years. And, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of, uh, you know, using plant-based uh, therapy in cancer. So, and I've, right. you know, again, I've seen it with my own eyes and, and, and written about it in my books. So can any of these, I know that when you have chemotherapy, it's not exactly the, the most uh, wonderful trip. So, uh, and a lot of patients uh, complain of, uh, pain, of GI upset, of sleep, of energy loss, anxiety. What's the deal with these compounds with that? Yeah. Well, the cannabis, my dad, the cannabis that my dad has been taking and a lot of other cancer patients also take this. It's a very highly concentrated cannabis oil that comes in a little plastic syringe and you eat these small droplets of this cannabis oil, tiny, tiny droplets the size of a grain of rice. And that can give you around 50 milligrams of THC and 50 milligrams of CBD if you have a one-to-one -one ratio product in one drop. So that's a very high dose. Um, for people that don't know, about 10 milligrams of THC is considered a recreational dose that someone may you know, use to get high. So 50 milligrams is a really, really high <laughs> amount. So you have to really start slowly with that kind of medical cannabis product. But what my dad has found with that, it has really, really taken away his nausea completely. He's barely ever had nausea and it's two and a half years in now. He's hardly had any nausea. His appetite came back as soon as he started taking this cannabis oil, which a lot of cancer patients, I'm sure you know, they completely lose their appetite. They lose so much weight and that really contributes to them feeling sicker and sicker as time goes on because they're not able to nourish themselves. So that was amazing. Right off the bat, he started to be able to eat full meals again and feel really well. And then he sleeps great because he takes a higher dose at night. He doesn't like to take a higher dose during the day because he still wants to get things done and not feel too you know, impaired by the THC. But at night, he's okay taking a little bit more and he has slept well the entire time. So I think that has been the main thing that's helped ease his side effects from chemotherapy. And then I believe that the mushrooms are what's keeping his immune system strong so he hasn't been weakened by the chemo. Gotcha. So your book is trying to remove the, the drug stigma of cannabis and mushrooms. Why is that important to you? Well, yeah, you know, when I, I, I quit drinking and quit using all drugs back in 2007. So it's been, for me, I swore off cannabis and mushrooms back then and, and alcohol. And, you know, I used cannabis and mushrooms in college recreationally, and I never thought of them as medicine. I never would have even had a reason to think of it as medicine. And so for me, that part is really important because my perception of all of this has completely changed throughout my research. And I've done so much research now into, you know, the prohibition of cannabis and, you know, the legalization of psychedelic mushrooms. And it is just, it has always been focused around patients. And I'm, I mean, of course, there's people that, that want to use it recreationally, but there has been so much focus throughout the years on, you know, getting these plants to patients who really, who really need to find relief. And I didn't realize that before. So it's really important to me to try to help to shift that perception to see how these can be medicinal for people and that it's not just about getting high or, or going on a mushroom trip. It's, it's so much more than that. So um, you mentioned that the dose is, is enough to get you high. 
Uh, mm -hmm. what, if, what if you don't want this effect? How, how do you avoid it? Yeah. So if, if you're using these, in the, in the book, I do talk about a lot of different wellness, wellness topics and not just cancer. So for cancer patients specifically, if you do want to take the THC and use that medicinally and not feel the high, you're just going to want to work up really, really slowly, a t tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of THC. For most people, two milligrams of THC is the, the threshold. If you go above two milligrams, you can kind of start to feel those those intoxicating effects. If you start a little bit lower um, and move up, you know, every few days, a couple more milligrams and just monitor how you're feeling, that can be a really helpful way. If you don't want to feel it at all, I would take a high CBD product with little to no THC in it. And that will, you know, give you the medicinal effects of the CBD without, without having the THC, but they do work better together. So if you have a little bit of each in there, um, they boost each other up. So if you can tolerate a little bit of THC for the medicinal effects, that's great, but you don't have to, you know, and if, and if you're not using it for, for your cancer journey and you're using it more for wellness, then you can absolutely just take a high CBD product with very small trace amounts of THC. Okay, so let's get away from cancer for a minute and let's talk about wellness. So give us your take, give us the thoughts of the book on why these may promote wellness, how do they pr promote wellness, and let's go from there. Sure. Well, one of the things that I found right off the bat through my research for my dad was all these different ways that it might be able to help me too, which is, um, you know, a totally different realm of why I use them versus why my dad's using them. But for CBD in particular, some of the, the main things people use it for are pain, sleep, and anxiety. Those are probably the top three. And I personally found help with sleep right away. And the interesting thing with sleep, anxiety, and pain is that a lot of times when people can't sleep, it's because of anxiety or pain. Either they, they have some painful part of their body and, it, and they can't sleep because of that, or racing thoughts, having, having those anxious feelings during the night, not being able to sleep. So using the CBD can take away the thing that is keeping you from sleeping and help you sleep deeper, which is what I experienced because I can have anxiety when I'm trying to fall asleep. And before I started on CBD, I would frequently you know, take a long time to fall asleep and then wake up a lot during the night with racing thoughts. And when I started the CBD, I, I was really able to, to sleep better. So that was, that was awesome. And as far as the pain goes, there was another kind of before and after moment that my dad experienced with CBD, which was before he got on the medical marijuana train, he was just taking CBD because that's all we had access to at the time. And what he noticed right off the bat was that his joint pain went away just from taking the CBD. He was taking CBD capsules. And he said, I don't even need, need to take Advil anymore. He used to you know, have all this joint pain walking up and down the stairs. He's been an athlete his whole life. So he has all these aches and pains. And he was like, I'm, I'm impressed by that. And he's not one of those people that just gets on the bandwagon quickly. you know. So he, that was really impressive. So the pain, sleep, and anxiety are three things that CBD can be amazing for. So let's, uh, I have a, a lot of patients who uh, have tried CBD um, primarily for sleep and for pain. And mm -hmm. I would say that um, just as a general rule, 50% of them seem to respond and 50% of them don't. Uh, yep. And of the people who respond, what's been fascinating to me is half the people, particularly with pain, respond to the topical CBD, mm -hmm. but don't to the oral, and the other half, they respond to the oral, but not to the topical. So mm -hmm. help me understand this, what's going on? Sure, well, you know, from a base level of why people respond to it differently is because we all have an endocannabinoid system, as I'm sure you know, in our body that responds and reacts with the cannabis directly. So, and everyone has their own um, Dr. Ethan Russo, who is a cannabis um, researcher, he he calls it the endocannabinoid tone that we all have this baseline tone, kind of like everybody has a different digestive system. You know, your gut flora is going to be different than mine. You have a different endocannabinoid system than me, so you may have different levels of natural cannabinoids, which we make in our body in your system than I do. So the cannabis will, well, and CBD in particular will kind of um, 
raise those levels, raise the levels of the natural cannabinoids that we have in our system. So if someone has a lower amount versus a higher amount, they're going to respond differently, which is why dosing can be really tricky and is really, really personal with CBD. Dosing and method of delivery, like you said, some people will respond to a topical, some to a tincture. It's all going to really um, be based on the person's individual endocannabinoid system. So let's talk about dosing and how do you know what you're getting? Obviously, uh, marijuana and CBD are legal here in California. Uh, and we've, we've got these shops almost on every street corner now. Uh, and how, how do you figure out, okay, is this stuff legit? This stuff came from hemp. This actually came from the marijuana plant. Uh, some people argue, no, no, you got to have marijuana-based CBDs, hemp CBDs, no good. Come on, help us sort this out. Yeah, well, you're, you're lucky to be in California because I really think California, especially at the licensed dispensaries, have, have, have it figured out in a really wonderful way. I wish that all dispensaries could be like the ones that I've visited in California. And that's because they have a... a a very wide array usually of ratios of product ratios out in California with um, different levels of CBD to THC that you can pick from and choose your, your ratio. Cause like I said, if the more THC in a product, the more you're going to feel those intoxicating effects. And so, you know, you can have a ratio of eight to one CBD to THC or 20 to one, and you can try all these different ratios to see what works for you. So I think that's wonderful, but to answer your question, the most important thing right now when you're looking for a product, especially a CBD product that's not from a dispensary because those are unregulated, you want to make sure you find a, you have, they have a third-party lab test. So that's to show that the amount of CBD that they say is in the product is actually on the lab test. So if it says 25 milligrams per serving, you want to see that on the lab test as well. And you want to make sure that it's negative for heavy metals, pesticides, residual solvents that could have come through the processing because CBD, like I said, is totally unregulated right now. It's really important to get those lab tests. If you do get it from a licensed dispensary, they have stricter regulations with the kind of products they're able to sell. So you're probably better off that way. But even if you're getting it from a dispensary, you may want to ask and see the lab test to make sure what, what you're getting is really what it says on the label. So if I'm on my road trip and I stop at the gas station and they've got <laughs> CBD oil at the checkout counter, which I've seen, that's probably not the one I want to buy. <laughs> it's probably not. No, I would not recommend CBD from a gas station for sure. Yeah, you really want to do your research and make sure the company is, is doing, like I said, those third party lab tests, meaning someone else is doing the lab test that's not affiliated with the company. So they can't, you know, make it up and it's and you want to make sure that they're using safe practices. And then just to answer your question about the hemp versus marijuana, right now it's all um, uh, legal terms. So hemp, hemp-based CBD versus marijuana-based CBD is basically just about the amount of THC and other cannabinoids, which are other compounds with, within the cannabis plant that are in the product. So if it's hemp, hemp-based CBD, it's basically just very, very minimal THC was gonna be in that plant. That, that was grown for that CBD. And if it's marijuana-based CBD, it, it basically just means that in that plant, there was a higher level of THC. And this is all, you know, these numbers are, are just um, kind of, you know, the numbers that they're using to differentiate these plants. But it's, it's all the same, comes from the same plant at the end of the day. Now bring us up to date. Um... The DEA once uh, classified this uh, substance uh, as really nasty stuff. Well, where do we stand? <laughs> where do we stand with the DEA, and where do we stand with the FDA with these substances? Well, right now, um, cannabis is still a Schedule One drug federally. Correct. So I hope that that will change. I don't know for sure when it will. I mean, people predict that that will change within the next couple of years. CBD, in, as of 2018, became legal federally, which is why you see the CBD boom everywhere. So CBD from hemp, which just means 0.3% THC or less, is federally legal. Anything more you have to get from a licensed dispensary, which will be different in every state. Some states have 
medical dispensaries only, which you're going to need a medical card in order to access those products. And so you have to go to a doctor, get approved for a medical marijuana card, and then you can go to a dispensary. Some states have recreational or adult use dispensaries, which is usually 21 plus. And right now it just varies from state to state. So things are changing every day. My hope is that it will become federally legal soon. All right, I'm going to throw you a, something out of left field. Uh, what do you know about black urine disease? I've never heard of that before. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so I, I have a very good friend, and I won't mention his name, who ran a company that uh, was really big into CBD and kind of put their whole careers into that and was working very hard with the FDA to get FDA approval for CBD. And you probably know that the FDA does not approve CBD. Yeah. Yep. Right. And interestingly enough, and I did not know this, because he said, I'm sure you've heard of black urine disease. And I said, no, I, I haven't. He said, well, it turns out that too much CBD can actually affect the same receptors in the liver that Tylenol hits, acetaminophen, and can actually poison the liver. And it was discovered because some very heavy CBD users noticed their urine was turning dark, like they had hepatitis. And it got the name black urine disease. And he tells me, and I'm not, I haven't talked to the FDA about this, that the FDA is worried that big time CBD use, and I don't know the dose, um, may potentially damage the liver. And that's why they put the brakes on this. But, uh, but look it up, it's fascinating. Yeah, you know, I have seen some things talking about CBD damaging the liver because of studies that they did in mice or rats. Right. And from what I could gather from these studies, the amount of CBD they had to give these rats was, was huge, like thousands and thousands and thousands of milligrams of CBD, like what it would, what it would equal with a human. It seemed very, very like a huge stretch to me, but um, I will look that up and see see what the what they're saying about black urine disease because that sounds pretty scary <laughs> and you probably couldn't afford to take that much right exactly so, and, well so let's get back to that is there is there evidence is there at least anecdotal reports about the amount of cbd that you have to use to be effective uh you mentioned that everybody's endocannabinoid systems different. So what, yeah. what, what should people look for? What do they try? What do you recommend? Yeah, as far as dosing, I mean, I've heard from doctors that practice with, with cannabis medicine that some patients do well on five milligrams of CBD and some people do well on 500 milligrams of CBD depending on their condition. So it's really, really different. But what I can say is a starting point for CBD, you want to start really low and take it by itself and monitor how you feel, you know, every 15 minutes, like, do you feel anything different? Do you feel you're more relaxed? Do you feel any relief of pain? Do you feel any relief of anxiety or whatever it is that you're trying to find relief from and pay really close attention and only take more if you feel no, nothing. If you feel nothing, take a little bit more, but you could start with like five milligrams, even something really small and see if you feel anything. If not, you know, around 15 to 25 milligrams is a standard dose for people, for many people, um, a standard kind of wellness dose. And then if you're having a high amount of pain or anxiety, you may need to take, you may need to take a little bit more and just kind of move up until you find the relief that you're looking for or switch products. If it's, if it's not, working for you or methods of delivery there. Like you said before, you know, topicals work really well for some people, for people for pain, for anxiety. A lot of people like to take the tincture under the tongue because that works usually within 15 minutes or so. And you can really measure your dose drop by drop. So I would suggest starting with a, with a sublingual tincture because that that's how you can really, really get a measured dose and say, okay, I took this, this exact amount where, where some of the other methods, um, you can't always know exactly how much you're taking. Okay, so we talked about anxiety, pain, sleep, and you used the buzzword 
the wellness dose of CBD. <laughs> so again, help me experimentally, anecdotally, where does CBD fit in a wellness regimen? Sure. Well, like I said before, we all have this endocannabinoid system in our body that CBD works directly with, and we have our own molecules inside our body that work with this same system that CBD can help to regulate those, those molecules. And they affect things like, you know, pain, sleep, the immune system, anxiety, depression, mood, you know, mood. They have, they have so many things that this endocannabinoid system affects. It really keeps you in homeostasis or keeps you in balance. So taking CBD as a daily tonic is kind of, you know, tonifies your endocannabinoid system and can keep things in balance. Many people just find that taking it, you know, a day as a daily thing, whether it's at night or during the day, depending depending how you respond, um, can just make you overall, you know, feel more balanced. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, interesting. Um, uh, Dr. McCollin and I have talked about CBD for sleep when we've been on each other's podcasts, and we uh, back years ago now did 20 milligrams of, of CBD sublingual uh, before mm. bed and tracked our sleep with an aura ring, which I'm holding up wow. to the camera. And quite frankly, uh, neither of us uh, found any effect on our sleep. And as I recall, and I won't put words in his mouth, he even tried it with THC and also found no effect for him or me. So we both kind of stopped doing it. But you're right, maybe our endocannabinoid system is so phenomenally balanced, and I hope it is, uh, <laughs> that maybe we would not see that effect. So that, yeah, or the other part is that sometimes taking certain amounts of CBD or THC can be more wake promoting for some people. And especially taking a little bit too much THC can kind of make you have those racing thoughts or can cause anxiety for some people. So that, yeah, again, it is, it is so, so personal. And some people will say, Hey, I take CBD and it makes me more focused and awake. And some people say they take it and it makes them fall asleep. So it's, um, yeah, it's an experimental journey. All right. So I'm sure everybody wants to know because you're a rebel apothecarian. <laughs> Uh, should we be regulating these substances? What's the best approach to regulating them if they should be regulated? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I really think that some of the licensed dispensaries in California are doing a really good job with, with the way that they are providing their products. I think that cannabis products with THC um, should be most likely just allowed in licensed dispensaries, but I do think it should be federally legal. I do think that pe anyone that wants access to cannabis medicine should be able to have access to it. I don't think it should just be, you know, sold at gas stations and have these low quality products on the market. I think that there should be, should be testing third party lab testing for all cannabis products and all CBD products. I do think that they should be regulated in a way where they have to, you know, contain exactly what they say on the label. So, yeah, I do. I do think it should be legal federally, and just as long as as long as the regulations are in place to keep people safe. So we're not going to pull up to the gas station and get a uh, six pack of beer and a, and a brownie to go. <laughs> I would say make your own brownies at home, which there are some recipes in my book. <laughs> Aha! Uh, I, I knew I could get a plug in for you there. <laughs> But as far as I will say also with, um, you know, with the magic mushrooms and legality and regulation there, um, the predictions that are happening for those are that they'll be legal within therapeutic settings because they are researching them for depression and even, you know, comparing them to SSRI depression drugs and seeing, you know, how they affect people. So I think that those mushrooms, which are, are currently illegal as well. Will um, will be available for use in therapy, and I don't think those should just be you know available at a gas station either. Those should be you know closely monitored. Yeah, my, Michael Pollan has has made a I think a very strong point that there is good increasing evidence that there is some bona fide medical use for these. I think particularly in depression, um, and uh, yeah, we need and you you know you 
argue for this, that we need to, to look at this as another federally regulated, licensed use of these products for specific reasons. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right. And uh, maybe you talk about that. The, the use of these products kind of in your own home is probably, at least in our state of understanding, not a great idea. This should be taken with a, a practice professional in a setting, in a controlled setting. What say you? I say if we're talking about psychedelic mushrooms, yeah. yes. I would definitely recommend that people don't just try it alone, um, whether it's with a, a trained therapist or someone who has a lot of experience guiding people through these types of sessions. I, I definitely think that having, having guidance is, is the way to go. Yeah, I had a personal experience in college where um, I, uh, one of my members in my singing group uh, dropped acid and uh, decided to, we were on the third floor of our dorm, and he threw up, open the windows and decided he was going to fly. And oh. luckily I grabbed him by his belt and pulled him back in. This is a true story. So I, I firmly believe from personal experience that this should be done in a guided setting. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, I agree. I mean, if you, if you take a little bit too much of a psychedelic compound. Um, I mean, it can take you to places that you aren't ready to go by yourself. So definitely. <laughs> right. And third, including the ground from a third story window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, Jenny, this has been great. Thanks so much for uh, joining me. And where do they find out about you, your book, your work? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. This has been just such a great conversation. And I'm glad you have so much personal experience with the topic, too, that makes it really enjoyable to talk about. So thank you. Um, my book is called The Rebels Apothecary. So you can buy that anywhere where books are sold, except right now we can't go into bookstores. So online, you can find that. Um, my blog is healthycrush.com. And you can find me also on Instagram, Jenny Sansusi. Healthycrush.com. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there's yep. a story. What's the crush? <laughs> well, the cr Healthy Crush, I've actually been writing there since 2008. So I've been uh, blogging about wellness and personal development topics for quite a long time. And the Healthy Crush just kind of popped into my mind. The tagline is a love affair with living well. So ah, it's kind of okay. The way, the way I've always felt about, um, you know, finding out about new wellness topics and getting excited about them and, and sharing. Very good, very good. Yeah. Okay, it's time for our audience question. Uh, Sandra Liliana on Facebook asked, is keto diet safe for people with heart conditions? Believe it or not, I do use my version of the ketogenic diet for my patients with heart disease who have also, for instance, diabetes as a co-founding factor and as a cause of their heart disease. The key in my ketogenic diet is you got to eat about 80% of your calories from fat, but that fat shouldn't be ribeye steaks. It should be fats from avocados. And for you people who are watching, I have avocado socks on today. And they should be from olive oil. And the more olive oil, macadamia nuts you eat, uh, macadamia nut oil, sesame oil, the better. And the key of a ketogenic diet is to really severely limit your carbohydrates to really leaves and vegetables that are going to carry olive oil and avocados into your mouth. That's totally different than a paleo or carnivore keto diet where the vast majority of the foods you're going to eat are heavy cheeses, heavy meats, heavy fats, you know, three bottles of cream every day. That's not what I use for my heart disease patients. So you gotta be careful in the term keto diet. There's a good way to do keto and there's a bad way to do keto, particularly for heart disease. So that, that's a great question, Sandra, and thank you very much. All right, Jenny, thank you again, and good luck with the book and best wishes to your father. How's he doing, by the way? He's doing fantastic. I've actually been quarantined up here with him 
for the last six weeks and he has felt so good the whole time. We keep saying we for, we forget that he has cancer. He's been off of chemo now for the past three months um, just because he's been doing so well that his oncologist said, why don't we give you a break? And his blood markers are in the normal range. His tumors have all been stable. So we're happy. Hey, very good. Very good. All right. Keep yeah. up the good work. Great. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks for having me. Take care. And now it's time for the review of the week. Following my most recent episode on COVID-19, Guido Brunelli Jr. on YouTube wrote, Thank you, Dr. Gundry. Clear info without fear and hype. Well, thank you. That was concise. And we're trying to give you the up-to-date information without the hype, without the fear, because, as you know, I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. So we'll see you next week. Thanks for the review. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.